Valle de los Caídos, in Spain, the Valley of the Fallen. Nearly half a century after the Civil War, the men who created and won that war have preserved its massive monument. General Franco called the uprising against the Republican government a crusade, a fight for Christian civilization. Others called it fascism. It was for nearly three years the world's moral arena. Inside this mausoleum today, there is no hint of reconciliation. This huge tomb for Franco's men was hewn in a granite mountain by his defeated enemies, Republican prisoners of war. Before this altar of Christian piety and Franco's victory lies a man who led Spain's fascist party, Jose Antonio. The great dome celebrates the victorious nationalists almost as a celestial host. And below it, behind the altar, the Generalissimo himself, Franco, now deeply part of the Spanish language, in homage or hate. As a soldier, Franco has served the Republic, but his heart was monarchist. He was called a fascist and died a dictator. The contradictions of Franco are part of the heart of Spain itself. It was said, in time to come, that Franco was a cautious and even reluctant conspirator in the army's coup d'etat, which began the Civil War. But he became Europe's longest ruling dictator of our century, the archetype of dominant endurance. When Franco was born in 1892, Spain was still a proud imperial power. Franco was a child with that empire dissolved. The American wars lost Cuba and the Philippines. It was a grievous blow to Spanish pride and also a knock for the young Franco. He had wanted to follow his father and brother into the Spanish Navy, but with the dissolution of an overseas Spain, that was cut back. So for Francisco Franco, it had to be the unglamorous and rather disgruntled army. For Franco, and so many of his class and generation, the army was his education. He confirmed the political images of the past, which were romantic, or ambitious, or probably both. Spain had lost its empire, but it still clung desperately and bitterly to its last vestige of glory abroad. In its protectorate of Morocco, Spain sought to erase its humiliations far away by redoubling its military dominance. At home, as so often in military restlessness, party politics meant very little. The officers were either indifferent or vaguely hostile. The only consideration, almost religious, was patria, the fatherland. As a career army officer, Francisco Franco flew very high and very fast. He became in succession the youngest captain major and colonel. By the age of 33, he was a general. He had commanded the Spanish Foreign Legion for four years, following his personal mentor, a much wounded and scarred hero, General Miana Stray. Miana Stray was the founder of this disciplined and brutal elite of the Spanish army. The Foreign Legion 
was used to suppress the Asturias Rebellion against the Republican government in 1934. This was the regiment's first military use at home. It was an experience no one forgot. And Franco advised on the conduct of the operation. Later, he was appointed chief of staff and served under the Republic. As such, he represented Spain at the funeral of the English King George V at Windsor in January 1936. Franco himself was personally and politically a monarchist. He supported the restoration of the Spanish king, who had fallen from power four years earlier. Few people know that Francisco Franco once nudged his way into the movie business. After the war, he wrote a feature film under a pseudonym, which reveals his contempt for democratic politics. The script follows the lives of three brothers. It's a situation not unlike Franco's own family. His younger brother, Ramon, was a Republican. And in this scene, one brother, who wants to be a Republican politician, is arguing with another, an army officer, about using his inheritance for a political career. The mother has agreed to share out the estate. It was perhaps easier for Franco to understand than for us. The film's breathless commentary goes on to describe the five years of Spain's fragile democracy, in Franco's version of events at least. Como si el reto de los dos hermanos tuviese un signo profético y fatal, así iba a dividirse la familia española. El Frente Popular que el Comité Comunista patrocinó va a destruir las puras esencias de la tradición española. La hora de la revolución comunista había sonado. España no podía perecer. Destruction of traditional values. Communist revolution. These were the catchwords with which the insurgent generals rallied most of Spain's middle class against the Republic. Petra Roman de Bondia was a young girl from a conservative family in Salamanca. I thought that the military uprising would bring an improvement in every sense. Our ideals and what we thought Franco and his army were going to defend were God, the homeland, the family and order. We thought that the rising would change everything. We never imagined that it would be such a long war. Before the war, in the five years of democracy between 1931 and 36, the Spanish Republic had not just been a new order. It had questioned all the assumptions of accepted society, and now some people wanted to put the clock back. Tomás Garicano Goña was a young army officer. I think that most of our hopes were fundamentally negative. That is to say, we wanted to stop certain things. Public disorder, the labor upheavals, which did so much harm to both management and workforce. We wanted to do away with religious persecution. Not only was religious education banned, but also any teaching by the religious orders. We wanted really to return to a more traditional Spanish way of life, a peaceful one, which this Republican government had failed to bring. The social upheavals of the Republic had led to a progressive breakdown of law and order. In the countryside, peasants hungry to own the land they worked seized it. Some landowners had been killed, and others feared for their lives. Peace was impossible, so we had to head for the hills. If it's just not possible to live, then you have to find a different solution, which was the rising against the Republic. 